my use of what you said to George, you know, how can I make this better, more impactful? I still am having trouble with the density field. And in general, I'd say that we all have these concepts and frameworks that we have learned. Uh, I think it would help to somehow depart from, you know, the common, you know, tie it back to something that we're used to thinking about or how to measure this density field differently, you know, put it as an experiment. It, it is hard when you have a new concept and you're not sure how it fits, and then you do operations on it, and that's that's what makes it hard to follow. Uh, in in, in <clears throat> chameleon cosmology, uh, the, uh, their density fields are densities, just basically. You just draw a sphere and calculate the density, and it's the density. You go back to their equations, which are the Einstein type equations with the, the Gurian. So if you want to understand what the density field is from the original paper, I suggest go back to that paper. <coughs> and the only thing that I've done is I've taken that density and, and now say, saying that, that the value of that density field now is also dependent on the accelerations that are going on within that density field. And that changes the value of that density. In fact, you, get, you in, uh, like the rocket equations, you can ignore the density of the rocket because the, the gases are moving so fast that, that uh, the, it's, it's a ratio of the acceleration of your particles over the gravitational acceleration. And, and if you're moving it, you know, hundreds, the gases are moving hundreds of times faster than the Earth's acceleration, that value is very large, so your density field value becomes very, very large. And, and then because it, it, the density field is under the bottom, your thin shell, once that comes very large, it comes very small. Um, it's still like, a, even though you're departing from the paper that it's got a basic fundamental concept, I think we, you know, we have to know what that is just to give us some... And, and that's what I talked to you earlier about, yeah. is that... Is that Somebody who knows how to work the Einstein equations needs to go back to the original paper with their equations, change the Lagrangian with the assumption that your your density fields will be changing, which will eventually change your thin shells, and try to come up with the Lagrangian, uh, the right Lagrangian that matches my model, and then you can write that paper and get your Nobel Prize. Well, <laughs> Talk about the math, or just the concept of what is a density field, how does it relate to what we know, or how do we measure it if it's new, even though it's other guys developed it, but yeah. it, since it's a, right. the, the bedrock of your talk, yeah. uh, that's what, you know, it, it, I, 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 I can't to. really tell, in the Einstein equations, these, these fields are scalar fields. I couldn't tell you what a damn scalar field is. I just, that's what they call it. Hell, that's what it is. You know, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, even though I have a BS in physics. People like you who have that common knowledge need to help me go back to the original paper and rederive and redetermine what these things really mean so that another paper can be written and submitted to a journal so that we can get this common model into the mainstream science. So I'm asking for help. But from my standpoint, as an engineer, these density fields are just the density of everything. You draw a, 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 you draw a boundary, and then within that boundary, you have matter uh, in some form or, or something. You deter and, and then you've got empty space, but empty space also has a density. There, there's, a, you know, there's a density of the universe. It's very small, but you have to assume that. But you can, so you can really ignore the empty space if we're talking in the local. <coughs> local, local density field framework. So it's just the same density as you would think think of. It, it's the only thing I've added is that I'm saying that the density field change is caused by the accelerations of the matter within your perimeter that you've defined. That's all I've done. <coughs> it's still a density, but uh, but under my model, you allow the density to change because of the acceleration. It, it, it really may not be, you know, density may be the wrong term, but, but I, I'm taking that out of chameleon cosmology. You know, you can, you can call that something else if you want to. I don't care. We can rewrite these papers to say anything you want to to make it match common. I'm just telling you what it is. <laughs> I'm telling you what it is. You tell me what it is. Okay. I just told you. It's, it, it, it's all the matter that's in there, all the density of all the matters in there, plus the accelerations of those particles that are in there. Can you go back and re-explain the slide that you had?
which showed acceleration with no mass and traction points. <coughs> I'm curious to see how any model of this sort can produce that result. Well, we're getting... Go to the last slide. I think that's a good one. It's a computer. These equations were derived utilizing what system I don't I'm not interested in having the right equations, but I'm interested in knowing how you can get equations that depend upon acceleration and the density of the field of some material sort. The acceleration that you calculate is the acceleration of your... Is this it? Uh, yeah. this, this acceleration and the acceleration you use for these are not the same. The, 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 uh, in the rocket equation, these just fell out. But if, if you, in, in your case, you would, that you have um, these PZTs, they're changing in size as you're moving it. So, so the matter, so you really, and this is a guess at this point, really you're saying, I'm saying that all that matter that create, that's made of the PZTs are being accelerated during the shrinking of your, or, or extension of your PZTs. So it's the, it's the acceleration of your PZTs that determine these R, R radial factors, not the, the acceleration of your total system. <coughs> It's a little more complicated than that. I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying that you may have to. But you're asserting that this equation is a general equation that covers all cases. And what I'm asking is how do you get acceleration of the object, A1 minus A2, or whatever it is out there, <coughs> with no mass ejection? Just density fields. What you're really operating on is this thin shell, and so your your momentum is conserved between your your system you have and the way you're changing the thin shell. So your acceleration comes from operating on this thin shell. And then because you're operating on this thin shell, your external field, it's saying, hey, well, there's a, th this thin shell has changed, so we've got to do something to make it correct and put it back where it belongs. And that, and that then causes it to move. It's like pushing on the dashboard to part to do some acceleration. Actually, in one of the presentations I presented, I, I, I said you can push on the dashboard of your car and move the car as long as you do this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if well, I don't. Uh, all, all I'm saying is, I think you can take what you've done, put it into this model, and then once you do that, then then you then you can put yourself in this frame, this frame of theory, which then then puts you in uh, then, then puts you into mainstream physics, so they can't say your theory's nuts. <laughs> But my mind, since we're talking about that, is already no new physics. In that sense, it is mainstream physics. Why well, would I want to introduce a hypothetical density field with all of these complications and ad hoc conditions in order to try and achieve what it's already I'm not about? saying you have to. I'm not saying that you're... I understand, but I'm asking why would I want to do that? Good. Oh, why would you want to do that? It's so that when you walk into um, the guy from Nyack, not here. Oh, yeah, there he is. Okay. And just, just assume that 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 um, NASA had a had a paper written about this model that was in the perfect form that we all worked together to put together to give to them. That way, when you walk in the door, and, and you want him to fund your your your, your research. They don't understand that stuff that you did, but they can understand this. It's fairly, fairly yeah, simple. I think it's probably the other way around at this point. <laughs> okay, I won't disagree with you. Uh, but, but it, okay, not you, but some other guy. Joe Blow walks into them, 
with a presentation that says if you do this under my theory, you will uh, you will get thrust with no mass ejection. And they're going, uh, well, we don't understand your, your your theory and stuff here. Can you put it in this framework so we so we can have a common base so we can compare it to 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 uh, Jim Woodward's work that he's doing? And then so so it gives them a common base to uh, evaluate uh, all, all different theories. On a common base. But all the theories that can be modeled in the sensor here, and, and so they won't that to me. So, um, <coughs> I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that uh, I've been look, I've been going to these conferences and listening to this stuff for many many years, mm -hmm. and from my standpoint, uh, with the exception of some outliers, uh, which I'm not going to mention, uh, you're all talking about the same thing. You're just talking about it in a different way. So, so you need to take what you're talking about and put it in a common framework so that the people who can give you money can understand what you really, or it not, not, it's not necessarily where they, they understand what you're they're doing, but it gives them a common base to basically say that uh, you, your theory is going to give us an acceleration that's 10 times bigger than his theory based, to, based by bringing your models into a common model. That way they can say, well, we better fund your theory than his theory. Yeah, but I prefer that you say my calculation because it's Einstein's theory. Okay. Well, I'd rather you say it's 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 uh, chameleon cosmology because this is just based on somebody else. I just it's rearrange it a little bit. <coughs> well, what you've done is you've taken a specific cosmological model which already has questionable assumptions about what's outside the whole sphere and things like that, and then you're arguing that there should be a uniform meta model, if you will into which all theory should be pushed. Yes. <clears throat> and I'm not saying this is the right model. I'm, I'm just, what I'm, I'm saying... I'm not sure that that helps. I, 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 I'm really, what I'm really telling you <laughs> is that we need to come up with a common model that we can take all the theories and put into that so that the people who f will fund you can at least have some inkling of what you're doing. That's a common objective, but I'm sure that this is. The and if this is the, not the right model, then I then I challenge there, any one of you guys to go out and find another one. I think there is a distinction, as Jim says. Some of this is in general relativity, so we have it. But maybe but this appears to have new physics, so it could. You wouldn't want to use it for. Existing physics, you'd only want to apply it, perhaps, you know, generalize something that's new physics. But no, I don't think this is new physics. I, Finchel is in, in a first year course in the physics uh, well, gra the, you know, undergraduate curriculum. I disagree. <laughs> I don't think anybody teaches Finchel in ballistics and undergraduate physics. But Not the book. What does it do? Rocket Finchel people theory? don't use, no, engineers don't use this. But I'm trying to give them a model that they can understand, that can get into the engineering, aerospace engineering books, so they can actually see a different pattern, or a different way of looking at things. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, but Jim's, well, the derivations that Jim's does will never get into an aerospace book, at least within any of our lifetimes. But this could. It's impossible today, but it may be possible tomorrow. Well, well, I say could, it could sometime. Uh, Martin's here, by the way. Uh, so I wanted to point out that uh, you could look at this thin shell as being either exotic matter or negative matter, because it actually creates a force that moves away from gravity. So from the standpoint of your um, negative mass, where you have a matter accelerating your negative mass, if you take the assumption that you take all this extended matter that's in this thin shell forward and condense that into a single mass, it's the same model as, 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 your, as your negative matter accelerating the mass falling. So what I'm kind of getting at, I, I have not seen anything pre uh, presented today that I couldn't put into this model. It may not fit the equations. The equations may have to change. I'm not saying they won't. But as far as this thin shell changing model, I haven't seen anything you couldn't put in that. 
It's just determining what those parameters are to get the right equations. So that you can say that this, these are the equations so that this model fits my theory. Yes? I may be completely off on this. Are you familiar with something known as Keynes method? Dr. Kane is a professor at Stanford who came up with what he called a system of generalized uh, forces, accelerations, and displacements. And it was his attempt to produce a, a generic framework into which any dynamics problem could be formulated. Uh, it was a very complicated process of translating it into his model, but once in his model, manipulating situations to be fairly straightforward. And for those who, who went to the trouble of learning, it was a very powerful method for doing dynamic analysis. It, it seems to me, and I could be again wrong, that what you're suggesting is something similar to what Keynes method It, sa it sounds like it, yeah. Well, you can, I, I don't know, you might look up Keynes method. There's a book out of there on Amazon. And see it. Sounds at all like what you're trying to do. There's a similarity. But, but, but is that I. K or C? It's a K and E. Well, well, somebody write that down and send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> um, my personal belief is that once you can get your parameters of, I'm not even really saying your theory, but of your experiment into this, the parameters of your experiment into this model, it will help you improve your experiment. Because, the, because these factors are in here really are your, your experiment, not really the theory. The, the phase factors, like I said, are, are going to be uh, f uh, properties of your experiment. They're going to be the masses and stuff changing in your experiment. <clears throat> the, uh, the radio factors are, are going to be something related to what you're doing in your experiment. So, so really, in a sense, I'm not saying to take your theory and put it in here. I'm really saying taking your experiment and put it in this model. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm um, just trying to wrap my mind around it. Um, so you've got the density inside, the density outside, and the density of the shell. And what you're showing is you know, the wing having a, a lower density in front, it's going to accelerate in that direction. Is that okay? So. Um, well, no, no, not necessarily. Um, this will model that case. It, uh, the 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 um, the field inside is going to try to recenter itself basically in a way inside the thin shell. Uh, it, it, the 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 thin shell change is either due to some change in the outside field or the inside field. Right, and, but in a sense, you're leaving the pressure, the density on one side, and increasing it on the other. And then it, you can look at it that way as pressures, or you can look at that as energies too. So you can say that the energy density is getting lower on the expansion side and getting higher on the other side, so that energy density is pushing you inward or toward try to recenter. It's trying to refine it. The thin shell is trying to find it, refine its center. Yeah, which, it which is similar to Alcubierre's warp drive, but I put it up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, very similar. It has a very similar theme to it. But in a sense, one of the things that I've conjectured about that, and, and if you're going to do that, where you're going to relieve the density on one side, you're still kind of uh, transporting mass or density from that area to the one behind you. So you still got to flow from front to back as you move forward in order to keep it going. Inertia. Let's go to inertia. In this model, inertia is the thin sh is the thin shell not wanting to move when you're stationary and want to stay changed when you're moving. So, so technically, once you've changed this thin shell, even though the model seems to do what you're saying, really what it is is that this this once you start moving, the thin shell stays out. The matter wants to find its center, but that. But the thin shell always stays the same distance away. You never catch up with it, except when something, op uh, some other force op operates on to change the thin shell back. So, so, so really, even though it looks like you're, 
you're getting a, um, a change in pressures. That's not really not what's really occurring. Hey, Tony, have you ever seen Richard Obusi's PhD thesis on generating the Alcubier metric? With uh, I, I may have, but yeah, what he did is it's kind of it's sort of kind of like this, but he uses brain theory and he brings that all into, into the picture where he says if you if you expand and this is his PhD thesis, but he says if you expand the compactified dimensions ahead of an object, you get and you contract them behind an object, you get this. You get the same up QBR metric, and it's it kind of it's sort of an, analogous to what you're proposing here about you know changing the density in front and the density behind. And, and I'm saying, but he's it, affecting yeah, it differently. And, and what I'm saying is, I don't know that I've seen anything that I could model by this, including that. I'm not saying that you, the equations may change, but the model stays the same. This is the same Al Cubier model, basically. You know, it, it's it's the same model Jim's doing. It's, it's, I, I, I haven't seen anything other than some really, there are some real outliers I don't understand. And, and the EM drive, I, I, I think I don't understand the experiment, but I think you can put it in that realm. Which, if we can go to my experimental slides, I, I wanted to try to both look at some of the experiments that are out there in this context <coughs> and present one of my own. Let me go while she's pulling that up. I just one more comment in terms of parameterizing multiple theories. It would be a help to, you know, you might have some one free parameter that takes on a spectrum of values and you would say that depending on the values it corresponds to this or that. Uh, when we look at this, there's a lot of parameters there. And it, it, it seems like there's quite a few. And of course, if you know, have enough free parameters, you can have anything. And I'm reminded my old thesis advisor, if I would come and say, if I assume this and I get this, and he would always say, well, why don't we just assume the answer? Yeah. You know, and save the step. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, you have to, uh, it, it, there's an economy of assumptions. <laughs> Get away from oh, yes. That's the reason I don't want to call this a theory, but call it a model. Because in a in an essence, you're kind of doing that. You're you're you're, you're saying, well, my theory predicts that I should have an acceleration that does this. Okay. Then I've got set up my experiment based upon my theory, and then from then you the, the, like I'm saying, the parameters you put into that is really not from your theory, but from what your experimental setup is. And and and, and so. You set up your experimental setup, put it in this model, and you say, <coughs> you claim you don't get this acceleration, you go out and test it, and you, and you don't get that acceleration. You guys say, well, why didn't I? You go back to this model, say, well, under this model, this is supposed to happen, and you go back to your experiment and say, well, that's really not what's happening. So how do we change our experiment to more match the model? It's not about that process, that's fine, but just it's the space of the parameterization. If it gets too big, or if you think it's too big, then uh, it becomes too big. I really think this is pretty simplified unless you, you, unless you do it in the cu couplings and you end up with about six coupling factors. We're a rocket engine. How, how many uh, free parameters are there that would cover all the theories? I couldn't answer that right now. Uh, but there aren't there ain't that many parameters in, in, in here. It's 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 uh, uh, the field force is six times a, a coupling factor, basically times a coupling factor square, the square root of a Planck link, which is known, over your radial factor, which you have to calculate, times the uh, the uh, force of the uh, uh, local gravitational field, basically. So that's uh, two coupling factors and your radial factor. But to get your radio factor, you have to know, you kind of have to know what particles you're, you are moving. And in some cases, it's your whole, whole mass. And in some cases, it may be fo just photons. In some cases, it, 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 it may be electrons. And so, so, that, uh, so that's one, two, it's four terms, basically, all you need to know, have to try to figure out. And which four are they? It's like the delta R. You have coupling factor to your internal field, coupling factor to your external field, the radial factor, but the radial factor comes from, from knowing the acceleration of, your, of some particle within your experiment. And what well, basically is just, your notation? Huh? In your notation of all of these parameters we saw, which, which of those 
you point to the slide and say this is the phase factor. Oh, oh and, and, yeah. If you do the phase factor, then you have to know um, some freak, uh, basically some frequencies of something, which in, in the rocket case, one of the frequencies is, is your exhaustion mass over your mass flow rate, which gives you a time, and, and the velocity of the gas over your radial factor gives you a time. So, so, so that may be a little bit more, but that comes out of your experiment. So, so some of these things come from your experiments, I'm not sure any of them comes from your theory. You just have to derive them from knowing, setting up this model. Once you set up this model, those four or five or whatever you have to do, like I said, some of it comes from the experiment. Some of it comes from uh, the, fa uh, the phase factors, comes from uh, doing some derivations based on what's going on in your experiment. So basically, all these, all these factors in this model come from your experiment. And your experiment comes from your theory. But uh, yours, is a, yours is a parameterized framework that has that covers everything on the spectrum, let's say. Uh, so I'm asking about your parameterization. So yeah, you might do the experiment and then map it to what you have. I'm just asking about your parameterization. I'm not sure there's any difference. Well, uh, you said it would cover all theories, and uh, so we do the experiment and plug in to your parameterization. But you would say, as you stay up in here and talking, maybe I should rephrase it. It will. I believe this model will cover all experiments that are derived from all, from most theories. I'm not saying from all theories. So, so there's some theories out there that are junk. <laughs> but. But what I'm trying to do is even those junk ones, if you can't, how, what, I, what I would say, if you can't put your experiment that's derived from your theory into this model, then maybe your theory is suspect. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's maybe it's suspect. Maybe well, it's something you need, <coughs> Maybe you re, need to rethink your experiment. Based on but you're pursuing a class of experiments, I suppose, uh, like spelling mass. I'm talking about, this, I'm talking about cases where you don't expel mass, but, it also works for cases where you're expelling masses. And, and I want to talk about why in some of these. But Tony, if I do an experiment that has an interesting result and I can't put it in there or characterization in any reasonable sort of way. I'm not saying you can change. Let me finish. It may be that your model is the thing that's suspect. Because yeah. after all, experimental results if done well, are facts, and the model is just a model. I, I, personally, I would say, if, if you find out that's the case, come talk to me and I'll help you fix it. <laughs> I don't need to fix anything. I, I, I know you don't, because... Observe in reality. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so, because I think yours is one of the very most easiest ones to put in this model. I doubt that. I, I well... I'll try to spend the next year or two trying to do to get right a paper of that, but I still think that this is very easy to put in this model. Your 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 experiment. You're changing the density field of the PZTs. I'm not changing the density field. Of the PZTs. Yes, you are I'm because the voltage PZT stack. And there's producing so electromechanical electromechanical motion of known physical elements. Your density fields are not known physical elements. Nobody's ever measured a density field on that. When you calculate your density field, you measure it. If, it is, if it's a calculation of a theoretical assumption that doesn't have the same status as an observed fact, I'm sorry. All I can say is I think your, your experiment it could be, seems to be very easily modeled under this assumption. Whether we disagree, that's fine. I don't, I'm not going to argue uh, uh, about that. My, I guess I'll get back to my, my main assumption is that we need a common base that we can give the people who don't know theoretical physics can utilize to, to make decisions to fund this type of work. And if we don't have that, then, it, then the funding that we're going to get is just going to be by somebody's blessing. That, that's a worthy goal. Why not try to do it without introducing things like field and density fields and stuff like that? Because everything else hasn't worked. That's not so. 
there's a parameterization for gravitational field theories that was developed by Cliff uh, Hill and uh, Ken Wardvet back around 1970 that is still in common use. Does Ron have that in his portfolio that he can utilize to evaluate what you're doing? Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, he can take Wardvet and Will's equations and look at the quotes. The terms that show up in those equations that correspond to the Are you going to do that? Or, or the reviewers that I uh, <coughs> that I solicit to support an evaluation could certainly do that. They would be more familiar with me, but I would make sure I picked a reviewer that was appropriate. Okay. That's fine. If you want to stick with what's there, all I'm saying is it has what what's going on now it isn't working. Because Ron and his reviewers don't have a common base to look at it for. Even though you may think there is. Since, <laughs> since, since I've been the focus of this. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to talk a little bit? I'm sorry. Sorry, Ron. No. It's called the PPN formulation of gravitational field equations. Parameterized post Newtonian is what that stands for. They've already done for gravity what you're proposing to do. But they don't have to introduce a hypothetical, imaginary density field that no one's ever seen. You know, and the question is, is your, is your parameterization, since it includes that, which is something which no one's ever seen, and of dubious existence, or whatever you want to call it, is that a step forward from your Reynolds' work? And, and I'm putting that out to you guys to make that decision, not me. I'm presenting a common model that I think would work. If you want to use it or not, I don't care. I'd like you to use it. Is there a simpler way to express what you're trying to say in block mode? I mean, just simple blocks and steps that you would have to use, that a developer would have to use to walk in? I mean, instead of going with all the formulas and stuff, I mean, that's... That's something that's deeper down in a paper, but to be in a proposal. You need a step-by-step -step block say. diagram. The model just basically says if you can set up a system where you can determine what's accelerating, what you know, what the particles are, so whether it's a black box over here. whether it's you know, this you got a black box here. Oh, you don't know what's in the you don't know what's in the black box. Yeah. Okay, that's just, that, 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 I mean, it, it comes up off the floor and it just sits here and Right, but somebody. So, but the thing is, there is. Are they going to require a detailed analysis like that? No. Uh, it's a box. It's got a battery on it, and it floats around. You need to have say, okay, this is. These are the steps you need to do. The basic steps you need to do to present this to an organization that may fund this, um, without going into elaborate detail on different theories and stuff. I like the stuff in the latter half of your paper, and that was, some of that was very, very critical. But can you s simplify this with some simpler steps in block diagrams so that we can pull it all together? Mm -hmm. I, I'd have to, I'd have to think. It, it's not here, so I'd have to go do it. I guess what you're asking to do, but uh, it's, it's. I won't say pro uh, yes. I can do it. I just need a little bit more detail of what you're asking. But from the standpoint of a black box, if you he came has in. a black box over there, and I have a black box. There. Okay. I know. Um, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, we're okay. just going to say, okay, here's, here's some necessary steps and necessary conditions you're going to have to make as a, as, a, as a developer to present basic information to somebody that makes content. From an engineering standpoint, if Jim came in with it, with with his uh, thruster, no, this is not engineering. This is this is something going on. No, the people who will fund you are engineers. Okay, that's one of the steps in the process. <laughs> that's one of the steps. If, if as an engineer, if you came into into my office and you had a device that would levitate in my office, I don't give a damn about that theory. You see, that's the thing there. <laughs> you don't care. About I want to know how you made it. Uh huh. So I can re re replicate it. And that's, so, that's the world we, uh, that you guys are living in. They're going to require some basic steps to say, okay. Could, could I get back to the, 
um, discussion that was going on also. So for those of you who don't know me, Ron Turner, I'm Senior Science Advisor to the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts <laughs> Program. Okay, and, and in principle, we could in fact fund people to do studies in this domain, right? Um, one of the, I couldn't, have, I couldn't agree more with Tony's assertion that there is a need to be able to compare the alternative approaches that are being discussed at this meeting and outside of this meeting, even at a level that could be understood at the headquarters level, right? Which, that's a really big challenge. <laughs> now, whether it's through a common model, okay, or a nice, thorough review from an impartial source that does have the fundamental understanding of the physics, such as you know, we've heard here already, that would be great too. Okay, So I totally agree with Tony that there is a need to be able to compare these models in some fundamental way that is communicable. Now, you know, when one of my jobs is to put reviewers on panels when we get proposals like this. And so I'm always interested in people who are available to do those reviews for me. And I'm going to go around and solicit such people. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, the fundamental idea that we need a way to be able to compare and communicate these different models is very important. And that's why I'm here, actually, is because NIAC agreed that it's important you know, for us to get a better understanding of things like this. So, you know, talk to me by email later, whatever. I'm going to stay in touch. Thank you. Well, thank you much. Um, now, I would like to come in this one. Well. So, if I make a funding proposal, let's say for a physics development, a theory development, or an experiment, or whatever, then I would completely agree with, with Jim that there is a really framework BPN approach, how much will that be from general relativity theory, because this is the baseline if you talk about gravity. If you talk about Hurtitzer Kahn, whatever, yeah, what is the deviation from general relativity? That's the deviation we're all interested in, right? That's the deviation from the standard. Why not put in a proposal for a new thruster, yeah, for break for partial, whatever, then also there are already figures of merit to put in. What is the power to thrust ratio and what is my specific impulse? Those are the two values that the propulsion guys are interested in. And we can compare against them. If I have a propellant propulsion system, then my specific impulse is the speed of light, <laughs> something like this. So that's much better than existing propulsion systems. Still, my thrust is very low for thrust to power ratio is not optimum with respect to current electric propulsion systems. So that's the gap I still have to fill. But so, these figures of merit already exist from an engineering perspective for thrusters and from a physics perspective for general relativity. That's just yes. what I wanted to say. We were here to say that uh, PPN is not what's needed, it's a more engineering... No, no, I'm saying if, for example, I make a, um, if, if I would make a funding proposal to develop, uh, let's say, Mach type effects or whatever, then I, I would target something like NSF or whatever, and I would target on, you know, is there a deviation from general relativity, yes or no? Is it maybe hidden in general relativity and it has just not been written out? Like uh, this is uh, what, uh, what, what Jim uh, has, has, uh, has been doing. So that's, but again, I always compare with respect to general relativity theory. When I go for uh, propulsion development, I compare it to existing propulsion devices. And those are characterized by the specific impulse and by the power to thrust ratio. So mass that's, guys that's don't my have specific impulse, it's infinity. If yeah, you don't have mass come out, you don't have mass. <coughs> we can argue about this if it's infinity or the speed I don't want to argue, you don't let Dennis have a talk. But, but, but so there is already, there is a very good framework from an engineering perspective for propulsion. The figure of merit is usually a specific impulse, <laughs> or for the physics, the reference is general relativity theory. There is no... I argue that, that quantum mechanics is the, is the theory you need to go towards, not towards that. I want Dennis to talk, so... Yeah, Dennis. About I, I, all right, right, the situation to me appears to be the following. Uh, there are more <coughs> theories than there are theoretical physicists. Uh, uh, each, each theory makes uh, assumptions, some more than others, and almost all of these assumptions are not experimentally verifiable or verified. Uh, I have myself tried to get some of these theories 
uh, most recently Ferris Williams stuff. I, I worked with Ferris before he died. Uh, and I went to the best physicists around. All right, I went to the people at Harvard and MIT and Michigan and a whole bunch, okay? And they said, no. They said, the woods are full of this stuff. All right, it, it, it would take us more hours than we have in a year, okay, to go through this stuff. And, and, and it probably won't be useful, okay? I, I mean, there is something here broken between conventional physics which, if you look at Wikipedia, the problems in physics, okay, there's page after page after page of really, really serious problems, all right? The 120 <coughs> orders of magnitude that quantum is off with respect to the cosmological <coughs> constant is just one, okay? And, and it runs on for page after page. I mean, physics, particularly at cosmological scales, is in an absolute unhealthy mess. Okay, if I was a physicist, I would hang my head in shame with this guy <laughs> of a record. Okay, now, now uh, you know what's been brought up is is how would we uh, parse which, if any of these, to invest in to go forward to try to investigate. Okay, and you can't go to the conventional physicists to get that because they won't touch this stuff. All right, so. You know, this is done in backyards and, and barbecues and, and you, you know, I mean, if this meeting does nothing before we leave here today, all right, we ought to figure out how to get the theory squared away, okay? There are immense problems with the experiments, all right? All the Georgia stuff needs to be checked. Uh, the EM thrusters and all the rest of it currently rest upon the experiments and the experiments are still very fluffy, need to have a lot more certification and really hard work. But as far as the theory, okay, with, with unverified or unverifiable assumptions, how can you possibly believe any of the theories? So, on that, it's data. Data is king right now. Verifiable bills and data. The heck with the theories. There's thousands of theories like you set up, and you can you can debate theories all all the time. But sometimes if you do very solid data, it's hard to debate that. Uh, if you have results that are repeatable, duplicatable, then you can have some. Then you can finally start taking some of that data and applying. Well, the challenge too is finding people that know what they're looking at when they look at the data. Well, that's true. That's that's a key, and you know having having had federal funding from the DOD for looking at two people in this room's work extensively from the company I work for. It was me walking into the chief scientist of Space and Missile Center and going, hey, I've, I know some work that may have an application and a mission towards national security space assets, and here's what it look, might look like. And they said, okay, go study it. So the key from the environment that I come from is, which is, DOD, national security, space launch, and all that kind of stuff, is that the, the people with bars, with, with birds and, and stars on their shoulders are going to ask, what is the mission? What, what missions can I do with this new widget that you guys have that I can't do right now? Or that I can't do with comparable systems that I know how they work for 50 years? Right? How is it any different? How is it going to allow me to extend my mission capability to support the warfighter? And that's the big, the big buzzwords because it's DOD, right? So... If there's a distinct pointing to that, even if it's 15, even if it's 20 years out, um, which is the division of the Air Force I support as advanced directorate, so we look out that far, then there's going to be some interest to go and have an independent, val independent look at these things. You know, and we may offer to bring things into our labs, or we may, you know, I mean, we direct some funding in that way. So, um, based on what I know about the NASA environment, that's not as easy to do because of the focus of NASA right now on Mars and SLS and aeronautics and a variety of other things that sort of, there's no clear mission for something like this in the NASA realm. But there's a very direct application and a very near-term application if it's national security related. Yeah, the only, the only caveat to that is there's some language in bills that are going through now to NASA that may ask NASA to specifically look at sure. propulsion. Right, so, right. 
And even though we don't have any particular language like that, the way that the Air Force is going in trying to manage space with smaller satellites, these kind of concepts are you know, looking, looking very favorable at this point. But again, how do you compare it with a system that we have 40 years of data on, like Hall thrusters? What's the thrust of weight? Is that going to impact my launch? Is it going inter to interfere with my sensors on my spacecraft? Those are the kind of questions they're going to ask. And then they're going to say, okay, you know, now the engineers and the technical guys go really run a comb through these theories and these ideas and see if there's really something there. And if not, okay, we'll come back in th two years, three years. You know, so that's sort of, you know, we can get funded studies, but it's going to be a real challenge, like you said, to find, some, find the right expertise. To, who, who's even qualified to look at some of these at an independent level, <laughs> besides the people in this room? <coughs> Right, so it's finding the right people to actually do these independent reviews with the requisite knowledge. It's also a challenge. Great, yeah. and it's very hard. Oh, for I'm any, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I think we. This is a great I'm discussion. Eating that time. Tony has kicked off, but uh, maybe we should bring it back to evaluating Tony's stuff. Or Heidi, did you have a? Is this one? Is that a good comment? Um, one thing that's, that's the one thing that breakthrough propulsion and people in this room have been working on uh, can um, can do that uh, customary rockets cannot is uh, sending probes, say, and missions out to the nearby exoplanets that we've been discovering. So 4.3 light years away doesn't no longer seem <coughs> that far, really. I was already considering eight light years away. Um, and also, that there's, um, so, so that's, that's the big thing that we can do that the customary rockets cannot uh, with, with breakthrough propulsion and propellantless propulsion. Mm -hmm. So e EM drives, Mac, Mac drives, all those kind of drives. Um, the other thing is the specific impulse. Um, the person asked me about that, and, and I looked it up on, on Wiki because I wasn't sure what it was. Being a theoretician, I have no idea what that is. So I looked up, it says uh, change your momentum uh, by di uh, divided by delivered uh, di propellant consumed. So we don't consume any propellant, so it doesn't really have any meaning it, for it, us, even though it has. Meaningless. It's meaningless. So it's based on exhaust velocity. Exactly. So yeah. so it's a velocity. So. It, Martin says C, but then C would be for all of us, and, and we wouldn't have any way of, of rating which, which is better than the other. So what, why can't we have thrust over power in? That That's would make exactly more sense. That's exactly what they do in the electric propulsion world. They don't use specific impulse. That's they what we should power. use. What I'm saying is the power thrust ratio and the specific impulse. Yes. Yes. The specific impulse here would infinity or speed of flight depends on the condition. Sets you apart from having a propellant propulsion system with respect to having to use propellant. And then there's the power thrust ratio. Okay. When you have specific impulse, what it tells you is how much gas you have to put on your rocket to get where you're going. If you run out of gas, you can't go any farther. So the whole idea of propellant less propulsion is that as long as you can feed energy in, you can keep going. That's the big advantage. What is the other one called that if it's thrust over power in? Is that given a different name as far as that also called? Or something else. I don't know even what that's called because I've never heard it used. I've only heard the specific it's impulse and I never knew how to define that. It, yeah, the, the, this is that, the, the, the metric you're talking about is used in electric, electric propulsion all the time. That's their, that's their figure of merit. Not so much thrust, but you know, um, you know, it's power per th power to thrust. You know. okay, but sense. specific impulse doesn't work because there, you know, there's in thousands of seconds and it's variable because you can throttle those things. So, so yeah, it's very, say. yeah. Makes sense. But the way I've always defined specific impulse is the time it takes to burn one unit mass of propellant while producing one unit force of thrust. Right. The higher the number, the more efficient. And that's why it's in seconds. It's kind of weird. Right. Uh, in the electric propulsion world, that's, that's referred to as alpha, which is the mm -hmm. power to thrust or thrust to power. And it's sometimes shown either, either way, depending on which is which is bigger than zero. But, the, the, but, but instead of propellant, what we have here is a power supply that we have to provide somehow or other, which has mass associated with yep. it. And, uh, and that will be the, the equivalent of the uh, running out of gas. Right. How much energy can this power supply provide? And more important for our case, what, what power can it provide? So you have two, two you have a, for the power supply, you need to know the specific energy and the specific power for the power supply. And then you can begin to do a mission analysis of trying to put together some kind of a system to accomplish some particular uh, objective. See, that's why I said it's not infinity, but because if you have a nuclear reactor on board, actually you're transforming EMC square. So you are converting mass into energy, so you are 
you have fuel that you burn, yeah, but it's very yeah. little one. Yeah. And actually, yeah. if you do the math, you end up with C over over 9.81. Uh, so that's a specific impulse of a propellant propulsion system that still uses energy. That's but why instead it's not of fuel. running out of a chemical reaction and a chemical energy source, now you're limited by a nuclear energy source, yeah. which is orders gives you orders of magnitude more opportunity than a chemical energy source. Sure. Does. That's and, the advantage. And the nuclear of the sources that we have right now are really good as far as specific energy is concerned. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen is is uh, provides a lot of specific power, right. but you run out of gas. Yeah. Uh, but now the uh, or the uh, for the nuclear, uh, they are quite poor so far as far as specific <coughs> power is concerned. Mm -hmm. So uh, we haven't we haven't got this worked out yet. No. Well, let's uh, let's tie this off. Uh, Tony uh, uh, sparked a nice discussion of what you know how we should parameterize the different theories. We're uh, just about out of time. Tony, I apologize if you didn't get to your slides, but at least you had a lot of interaction. Is yeah. there anything you'd like to say? I got one comment, and it's no disrespect to Jim, but, but, it, but due to this type of discussion, it sounds like we need to take his axe and shovel and keep digging. Uh, well, you know what? Set aside the hatchet and use the <laughs> shovel, okay? <laughs> Dig deeper. The Wright brothers were told that you can't fly. The Wright brothers proved it, but it took decades to figure out how you could fly, how actually wings work. And it's just recently we figured that out. So I'm not really concerned that there's no real theories behind any of this. It yeah. really just doesn't matter what results is the data. And there is no bad data. Yeah, and yeah. for example, if I may add to this, yeah, right? Best example is always, I think, high temperature superconductivity, right? <laughs> We use it uh, all the time. We still haven't got a clue how it works. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah. Okay. Well, let's thank Tony.